Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar this afternoon on the Veteran Occupational Licensure um, Program at Ivy Tech. This event is hosted by the Council of State Governments and Ivy Tech Community College and made possible through grants from the U.S. Department of Labor. My name is Adam Deersing and I'm a research associate at CSG and it is my pleasure to introduce the Director of Public Policy at the Senate the Center of Innovation at CSG, Elizabeth Whitehouse, to tell us more about CSG and to introduce our keynote speaker, Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm so excited about this conversation. Founded in 1933, the Council of State Governments is the nation's only organization serving all three branches of state government. And uh, I guess not only uh, across all 50 states, but all five territories as well. We have a unique ability to convene state leaders and stakeholders to develop and share best practices and policy solutions. Our CSG policy work through our Center of Innovation, which was created in July of 2018 and coming up on our third anniversary, was established and created to provide an enhanced focus on utilizing grants and external funding to meet the needs of state officials seeking innovative policy solutions to the issues of today and tomorrow. I love this project with Vallo and the whole portfolio of occupational licensure projects. Um, and we're so appreciative of the opportunity to partner with the US Department of Labor for this work. Both of the, the pieces of our VALO work that we get to partner on and our whole portfolio around occupational licensure provides the opportunity to focus on relieving burdens on individuals looking to enter the workforce. Many of these burdens are spe specifically and especially heavy on military veterans, transitioning members, uh, service members, and their families. States are working hard to streamline and expedite licensure for military spouses and partners. And we love that this is an opportunity to also think about the ways that we can look at the education and experience uh, that service members have come into the education system and how that can count as the states help, as we look to help states find pathways that recognize those education experience and training opportunities that our service members have had and how that works towards stateside occupational licenses. I'm so excited that I get the opportunity to introduce Lieutenant Governor Suzanne Crouch. Prior to becoming Lieutenant Governor, she served as Indiana's State Auditor and as well as a State Representative. She was elected to that seat in 2005 and has served as the Vice Chairman uh, of the Ways and Men's Committee and on the Public Health Committee. Governor Crouch oversees a portfolio that includes the Indiana State Department of Agriculture, Indiana's Housing and Community Development Authority, and so many other areas as well. As, as she also serves as the president of Indiana Senate, chair of Indiana's Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission, chair of the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Task Force, chair of the Indiana uh, 2020 Census Committee, and uh, especially pertinent with this work, oversees the Next Level Veterans Initiative and the Next Level Connections Initiative. I'm especially inspired by the Lieutenant Governor's commitment to veterans with the Indiana Vets Program. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Crouch, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your passion for supporting Indiana's veterans. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. It's such a pleasure to join you and Ivy Tech and the Council of State Governments as we talk about veterans and all the things that at least we're working on doing here in Indiana to support them and their families. You know, Indiana has been such a strong proponent of higher education, and we support what Ivy Tech is doing to ensure that the workforce needs of Hoosiers are being met. But what you may not know about Indiana also is that whenever our nation has needed heroes, Indiana has always answered the call, and a sense of duty runs through our Hoosier veins. In fact, Indiana per capita is one of the leading states in sending men and women to defend our country when it is needed. So let me share with you a little bit about where we are today and then where we were back in 2017 when we decided to uh, institute the Next Level Veterans Initiative and kind of what got us to that. And then I'll talk just briefly about the program also. So today, Indiana's economy is booming. In 2020, in spite of COVID, 
Indiana was able to create 31,000 new job commitments, which was a record five-year high. Uh, and our unemployment sits at 4%, which is below the 5.5% national average. But what we have in Indiana is we have 108,000 job openings, jobs that could be filled if we had the workforce to fill them. So after our first year in office, uh, Governor Holcomb and I looked at how do we fill that gap? How do we get workers into the workforce? And what we did in 2017, our first year of office, is that we created the Next Level Jobs Initiative, which worked at providing grants for not just employers, but employees to skill up and to have the training for the 21st century jobs that were out there. Uh, our economy was also booming back then. We had a 3.4% unemployment, but we also had at that time, 85,000 jobs that were unfilled in Indiana. So in spite of all that we were doing to train up and skill up our workforce, we needed more bodies. And what we decided to do and what we launched in January of 2018 was our Next Level Veterans Initiative. Our Next Level Veterans Initiative is really aimed at attracting men and women who are transitioning out of the military to Indiana, integrate them into our communities so that they can call Indiana home. Uh, there are some 150,000 men and women who will transition out of the military every year. And they are men and women who uh, have skills, who have training, you know, who have demonstrated the ability to be able to work and have a good work ethic. And so they, that group of individuals seem to be uh, maybe a solution to our problem at the time, which was we didn't have enough people working in the workforce. So we formed a public-private initiative and launched the Next Level Veterans Initiative in January of 2018. The public-private initiative actually has three state agencies, my office being one of them, that are participating. And then we have corporations and we have economic development corporations throughout the state, nonprofits, that also participate in this partnership. So what it does, and, and I want to also mention that this initiative is led by all veteran employees. So they know what those men and women transitioning out of the military want and need in a job and how to get them here. So what we, what we did was we launched this initiative it is a website where employers can go and they can put a profile on about their company and the jobs that they have available. The veterans also can enter onto that website and they can create a profile and they can state what they are looking for, what their training is. And then what we try to do is match the veteran up with the employer. And to date, we've had some 2,500 veterans that have actually created profiles. And we have some 400 companies, 250 of them are active, but some 400 companies that have created a company profile. One of the other real important, we think, aspects of the website that we have is there's a quality of life component because we know that 49% of men and women transitioning out of the military, 49% indicate that they will not stay at their veteran, at their military base, nor do they want to go to their hometown. So almost half of those men and women transitioning out of the military want to go somewhere new. And we know that quality of place and quality of life is extremely important. So on that website also, we have economic development corporations that have created a profile on that region talking about the quality of life and the assets that are available that those veterans may be looking for. 
Uh, to date, now to date, we have attracted over 400 veterans to Indiana. Uh, and then we just I, recently, Duke Energy announced that they were providing a grant, a pilot program to put two part time employees on the bases to be able to actually actively recruit those men and women who are thinking about transitioning out. Because we know that that personal relationship, that personal contact is absolutely critical to get them to Indiana. Prior to COVID, we were able to visit nine bases and I actually took a base visit, did a base visit, uh, where we were able to sit down with the men and women who were transitioning out and having those conversations and selling them on Indiana and getting them connected. Well, COVID kind of stopped all that. So that is, uh, we still haven't been able to actively get out there on bases yet, uh, but we are, our goal is to be on 25 of the largest bases uh, to have part-time employees who will be working every single day, having those conversations with our men and women transitioning out, selling them on Indiana, our quality of life, and matching them up with employers so that they can come to Indiana with a home and their families can get integrated into our state. Uh, so the things that are really interesting and unique about this program Oh, and let me mention that we believe when we're fully up and operational at all 25 bases, our goal is to attract 5,000 veterans a year to the state of Indiana. So we have a ways to go, uh, but as we keep getting better as a result of people getting vaccinated and getting out of COVID, we feel pretty confident we'll be able to get there. Uh, but what makes this kind of unique is that, um, one of the perks that we have in working with our private public partnership is we can provide free hotel rooms to any veterans that are wanting to come to Indiana uh, to be able to interview for jobs or to check our state out. There's also, uh, uh, we have something that is extremely unique and in one building that we own, that the state owns, we have nonprofits there that work with veterans. We have state and federal veteran organizations there, the American Legion, the BFW. We have an outpatient clinic for veterans. Uh, we're getting ready to create a co-working space, but it's to be able to encourage collaboration, uh, to get everyone working together so that we can attract those men and women to Indiana and we can help fill those jobs that we so desperately need to fill here in our state. So, I, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but what I want to leave you with is our website address. So you can yourself go and check it out. Uh, and that website is invets.org. So all caps, capital I, capital N, capital V as in Victor, capital E as in Edgar, T, as in Tom and a capital S.org. So go check it out. Uh, and uh, as far as we know, we are the only state that is doing a comprehensive approach like this. There are certain cities, um, certain communities that are trying to attract veterans, but as far as a statewide initiative and a statewide effort, I believe Indiana may be the only state that is doing it at this level. So. We know that um, we have a lot of work to do, but we also know that we are a welcoming place for veterans um, through the housing agency that I oversee. We have a veteran ho homes for homeless veterans and we have a number of initiatives to be able to encourage and support those brave men and women who have given so much so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we have today. So again, thank you to Ivy Tech. What a great, great, what a great, great partner they are uh, here in the state of Indiana as a community college. And thank you to the Council of State Governments for allowing me to be a part and to be able to highlight some of the things that uh, we are doing here in Indiana. 
So thank you. And um, I hope someone learned something. We are always available if you have questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, and, and especially thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Um, we are always proud of the great work we do here at CSG, but we know that it is the, the hard work and dedication of, of our members in state government, like the Lieutenant Governor, that drive the good work that's being done in, in every state. So thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor, and we are, we are so happy to have had you join us. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Um, Okay, so just a, a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, move into our speakers. Um, closed captioning is uh, available. And if you have any technical difficulties or if you have any questions about Zoom, please use the chat feature to type a question and CSG staff will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and to ensure our speakers can be heard clearly, all participants will be muted during the meeting, um, but the session is being recorded. So by continuing to participate, you are consenting to this recording. Um, and we'll be distributing the recording uh, on our website at licensing.csg.org. Um, and we will send out uh, an additional notification once that is available. Um, so I would like now to introduce our presenters for this afternoon. Um, Amy Stone is the Program Director for the Veterans Accelerated Lic Learning for Licensed Occupations or VALO project at Ivy Tech Community College. Also joining us is Sarah Pell, the Director of Policy Initiatives at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact, and Max Morley, a Policy Analyst at the Council of State Governments. Uh, last thing, we will be having a Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we will get to them at the end. A quick disclaimer about the CSG Occupational Licensure Project. It is a multi-year DOL funded project that partners CSG with the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Governors Association, with the goal to identify licensing criteria to ensure that requirements are not overly burdensome or restrictive and to improve portability and reciprocity. And as I mentioned, that's the, the link to the licensing portion of the CSG website. So I will now pass it to Max Morley, policy analyst at CSG uh, to discuss um, veteran licensing barriers uh, that exist as, uh, as of now. Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, and thank you to everyone who has joined us, including our speakers, both before me and after me. Uh, we all really appreciate you taking time and sharing your expertise with us. So uh, uh, what we're gonna talk about, and James, you can go to the next slide, uh, is kind of where we are right now as it, as it is with occupational licensure generally, but some of the particular issues around occupational licensure for our veterans and for our transitioning service members, those folks who are in the process of coming back home. So when we talk about occupational licensure, if we back up just a little bit, what is that? We hear it a lot. Uh, most of us uh, ha either know someone or, or have one ourselves, uh, but an occupational license is essentially a uh, a, a certificate of some sort, some type of certification controlled by a governmental entity, whether it is localized, state, federal, uh, but it is essentially a permission uh, to practice a certain occupation within that jurisdiction. And over the last 60 years, uh, the number of jobs that require one of these occupational licenses has grown tremendously. Uh, it used to be about one in 20. The way it is now, we're sitting at about one in four jobs require some type of occupational license. Each state uh, largely controls all of the elements of occupational licensure within their jurisdiction with very, very few exceptions. And so this includes things like occupational licensure law, regulations and policies out of the executive branch, uh, the implementation, the oversight and the administration, all elements of occupational licensure uh, are largely controlled by the state. There are some that are federal, uh, think things around interstate commerce, um, transportation, things like that. But for the most part, 50 states, uh, and James, if you can go to the next slide, uh, each state controls their own, uh, their own licensure rules and regulations and laws. Uh, so on the good side, that is helpful because states get to tailor their laws and regulations and their environment to their own state issues. Um, but one of the things that does, a side effect of that, is it creates a lack of consistency among states, uh, even uh, regionally. So what you end up with is a 50-state patchwork of occupational licensure laws and rules and regulations that 
uh, don't always match up. So if someone's looking to move from one state to another, or if they have an occupational license, go do a term of service in the military and are looking to relocate back home at another state uh, other than their home state, there's a lot of uh, discrepancies between the requirements probably uh, between those two states. And it's gonna be a different uh, set of gaps between each state and each other state. So uh, that 50 state patchwork is something that uh, everyone looking to move between states has to deal with, but might be particularly troublesome for someone looking to return home to a different state uh, and try to transfer a license. Uh, as far as state trends around occupational licensure go, many states do not allow their state licensure boards to even recognize uh, military education experience and training towards civilian licensure. And the states that do allow it typically don't require it. Uh, and then the states that, if, if it's allowed in their state and they choose to pursue that, there's typically not a, a standardized process. It's largely a case-by-case -case basis, which even in that situation leaves a, a, there's low clarity for these applicants, these veterans, these transitioning service members. There's a lack of clarity for them on what the process will look like, how long it will take, uh, and their chances for approval. And there are a few standing precedents for them to turn to uh, since it is largely on a case-by-case -case basis. James, we can go to the next slide. So um, another barrier that uh, we run into is cost. So there are different types of costs that uh, apply largely to everyone, but especially to our veterans and transitioning service members. There's obviously the monetary cost of licensure fees, of perhaps having to take new tests, complete new coursework. There's a time cost that is inherent in all that as well, uh, which is, uh, and then there's often you have to start from scratch instead of filling gaps of a few additional hours or courses, what might be just some gaps you need to fill. And we'll talk about why in just a moment. Um, often these folks have to start from scratch, which is obviously a, a, an aggravator to that monetary cost and that time cost. And inherent in all of that, is this very large opportunity cost of working uh, and generating an income. So if I have to take uh, another six months of courses, then that's six months where I'm not gainfully employed making an income. And that obviously makes my transition back home much more difficult. James, you can go ahead. And then uh, an issue particular to uh, military circumstances is a less than honorable discharge. So uh, a lot of the state and federal benefits for veterans that, and even those ones around licensing that exist, such as expedited licensure, we'll talk about more in a minute, uh, they only apply to veterans who are honorably discharged. And so the circumstances of someone's discharge could be wholly unrelated to their ability to safely perform a job. And these, these individuals are at an even greater disadvantage than uh, the disadvantages faced by your average veteran transitioning service member. Uh, James, we can go. So some trends that we see right now in states as far as trying to tackle some of these issues. We see fee waivers, which are exactly what they sound like, just a waiver of the fee that an applicant would normally have to pay in pursuing an occupational license. We see expedited licensure policies, which are if you are a military veteran, a transitioning service member uh, in, in sort of a related class like that, you are um, not necessarily put at the front of the line, but there's typically a shorter period within which uh, the licensing board has to process your application. And so we see, you know, maybe 30 days as opposed to a 90 day. Uh, so just trying to get those processed more quickly. And then a lot of states have adopted military family policies because this, the issues around licensure don't just exist for our military members returning home. They're also, they also exist for their families. A lot of military spouses work in licensed occupations and they move on average every two to three years. And so these problems are also faced by military families more widely uh, and not just the military members themselves. James, go ahead. Yeah, and, and uh, another note on these uh, policy approaches is that while they, they get around the edges and, and they do tackle some of the related problems, none of them get right at the heart of what the issue is, which is the recognition of experience, education, and training that's gained in the military and, and applying those things when a, a member is trying to earn an occupational license back here at home. We can go ahead. So why? You know, all of these issues, why do they exist? Um, the biggest reason is that civilian side occupational licensing boards in the military are speaking different languages. Um, a lot of the, the language used to classify and characterize 
the experience, education, and training earned in the military is not the language that is used on civilian side. So while a civilian board might be looking for uh, a degree, certain types of classes, certain types of training, uh, and certain, maybe not quite to a degree level, but certain education in certain arts, um, the military does not classify them using the same language that you might see, and Amy, I think, is going to talk a little bit more about this, uh, does not use the same language to classify those things as does a civilian board. So what you see in a board is that they're going to err on the side of caution. Number one, they don't want to break the law. Boards, uh, licensing boards, gain their authority uh, typically through a legislative branch and sometimes gain some authority through executive branch uh, uh, orders as well. But what they don't want to do primarily is run afoul of their, their law, their authorizing statute. And so what they'll do is just not take the risk. If they're in a state that, you know, states typically don't require these licensing boards to consider military experience, education, and training. So a lot of these state boards look at this and say, this is a different language. We can try to figure it out, but why take the risk and maybe run afoul of law? And the other worry of, of um, not doing that translation correctly would be misidentifying some gaps. In, identif in trying to get more granular and make that translation happen and trying to identify the specific gaps in education or the gaps in training that these military members might have in order to gain an occupational license on the civilian side, uh, if they mistranslate that, they maybe not just don't cover those gaps, they may accidentally create new gaps in training and education um, before they reach that occupational licensure stage. So generally, Boards don't want to take the risk, and when you zoom out from boards and look at state governments more writ large, policymakers sometimes just don't know what they don't know. And so, so projects like VALO, projects like the OL project, um, it, it is one of the goals, like Adam talked about earlier, is to help move the ball forward and fill in some of the gaps of knowledge so that we can help move forward the, uh, the, 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 the hope that veterans and transitioning service members can gain credit for the hard work that they've put in while they're serving our country. James, we can go ahead. So uh, thanks everybody for your time. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, all of us are gonna be happy to tackle those once we get to the end. Uh, and really quick before I uh, hand it back to Adam, uh, and I know Elizabeth mentioned it earlier, but we wanna thank um, Ivy Tech for bringing us on uh, and allowing us to help out with this project. Their, their partnership with Ivy Tech has been outstanding uh, and we really appreciate uh, getting to work with them and we look forward to continuing work with them on this project going forward. So Adam, I'll hand it back to you. Great, thank you so much, Max. Um, we will now turn it over to Sarah Pell from the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Uh, James, if we can get the, the slideshow back up. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, for the wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about uh, licensing. I was a former Hoosier, so, um, you know, once a Hoosier, always a Hoosier, right? Um, and I want to thank Max for really bringing out um, some obstacles to licensing. Next slide, please. So every good trip, travel has, has an obstacle, right? Um, so there are really three uh, that have been identified. Um, one is, of course, the lack of recognizing applicable military training and experience. And by applicable, I mean it actually transfers to a student's degree program and is not left out um, for uh, other uh, credits. Uh, next is a large amount of red tape that can cause folks, you know, just to give up. And then when they do that, the state doesn't really have the opportunity. It, ha, uh, it you know, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so states then aren't able to fill occupational gaps that they have, um, especially ones that they have a great need for. And third, um, you know, it, a perfect example of a, a barrier about professional services: um, teachers uh, needing to take additional coursework such as um, a class on the state's, on the state's history uh, for the application that they are giving to for a posted job. Um, I live maybe 30 minutes from the Illinois border here in Southeast Missouri. And I went uh, and applied to a school on the other side of the river. And I had to take a course on Illinois history in order to uh, get my license. 
So there, there are some crazy ones out there. Next slide, please. All right, so this is where I get kind of nerdy. So you have to excuse me. Um, so let's talk some numbers. Next slide, please. So this is a diagram of uh, how many estimated uh, military personnel uh, transitioned to the Midwest in 2018. And as you can see, uh, there are some states where there were high return rates and some that maybe didn't see uh, that many. Uh, an estimated count of those uh, coming back to the Midwest in 2018 was about 50,000, and that's not including spouses. Next slide, please. As part of the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit, we wanted to learn more about those folks with the potential of returning to our states. So we needed to know what jobs they did in the military to better prepare for them. So in 2016, uh, the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit, or MCMC, we used some grant funding to uh, get this estimate uh, of the Occupational Specialty Code, or ONET code. And it provided us uh, the numbers of potential military and what they would bring back. We really wanted to know this information, again, to look at licensure certification, if additional education programs needed uh, to be addressed to fill these occupational gaps. So as you can see, the largest one uh, returning to the Midwest is infantry. Uh, then of course we have police officers, uh, aircraft mechanics, service technicians, artillery and missile crew, uh, stock clerk, stock room, warehouse, storage yard. So um, some logistics and heavy tractor trailer truck drivers, again, logistics, emergency medical technicians and paramedics, automotive master mechanics, armored assault vehicle crew members, and cooks, institution, and cafeteria. So what would we do with folks coming back to our states that had an MOS of an armored assault vehicle crew member? So that was, that was something that we looked at and uh, are still continuing to, to work at. Um, one of our states, uh, I'm not gonna name the state or the institution, back in uh, 2012, they established an, an accelerated two-year program to allow uh, folks who were a 68 Whiskey or a military medic to obtain um, an, a degree in nursing. And uh, they did a great job. Uh, they, they did this heavy, tremendous lift on uh, what the curriculum would be. Uh, they looked at the licensing. Um, you know, they wanted to attract all these folks to get into nursing. Uh, again, big occupational area for them. Um, but they closed after, or this program closed after two years because they didn't have the, they had a lack of um, military folks returning to this area uh, that uh, aren't medics, uh, lack of enrollment in the program. And a majority of the time, those with an MOS chose not to continue in that career track upon separating for the military. And what we've learned uh, over the last couple of years is that MOSs don't always translate to the civilian workforce. And really students just want uh, to pursue a career totally different from their military job. And in a study done by Student Veterans of America, uh, according to their 2020, census, their 2020 census survey, 63% of student veterans major or field of study is not at all similar to their military specialization. So that's why um, we need to get in on, on the basis and, and talk with folks and see what it is that they want. So the lesson learned from the state and really from all of our Midwest states is know your audience, know who's coming back and work with them and try to be prepared on what interests they might have. Next slide, please. Okay, more numbers. Um, of course, uh, it's all about the, the numbers and what do we do with them. So the top three states uh, with the most licenses are Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And this information came from Career One Stop, which is part of the U.S. Department of Labor. So we've got some uh, good statistics. Next slide, please. So looking at various methods uh, that Midwest uses uh, 
to assist active duty uh, veterans, or I'm sorry, active duty military personnel or veterans. Uh, the largest one, they use uh, a temporary license, 203. Uh, expedited processing with the temporary license in the interim is 25. Is 25. Um, expedited is 31 and reduced licensing fee is 46. And we had another state that had um, some different avenues to go by. Uh, the licensing is, uh, the license information is compiled by an agency and it's really difficult uh, to pinpoint exactly which agency submits this data. And sometimes they don't submit the data um, to the Department of Labor and so these numbers can't be confirmed and there's really no way to guarantee that each state um, collects the license in their license information for their state. And um, the undetermined is the biggest amount of uh, issues that we need to uh, address. And that was 2,246 licenses are completely unaddressed. There's no information out there. So how are active duty veterans returning service members going to know uh, what that uh, license process is for that state and that occupation. Next slide, please. And uh, Max touched upon this a little bit earlier. Uh, so why is obtaining an occupational license in a different state so difficult? Well, it's like Max said, it's typically state-based state licensing state licensing standards vary substantially from state to state. And uh, I think this is really important. Uh, even though a profession has uh, a standard that everybody adheres to, has a national standard, that really doesn't mean much if you're applying for a state license, uh, occupational license, because you have to have both. So you might meet one, but not the other. Um, one thing that we've also learned in uh, the states, uh, some things that they ask for are additional coursework. Um, maybe they don't have uh, enough apprenticeship hours that they need uh, to fulfill. Uh, they need to pass the state exam. And there's really a, a lack of understanding of the training that service members and veterans have on those, on those bases. It's really intense. Um, I think one week, of uh, training equals three months, I'm sorry, like four weeks of, of college. So it's, it's very intense. I mean, they do it from sunup to sundown. So again, it's very intense. Next slide, please. So we wanna talk about some solutions with potential. So what are some things that states or regions can do to improve this? Next slide, please. So one of the biggest ones, of course, is uh, interstate compacts. And CSG has been a leader for this uh, for many years. Um, there currently are three compacts uh, for seven occupations, six of which are in health professions, which is, uh, again, one of those big gaps that we have in our workforce right now. So what are some benefits of these interstate compacts? Um, they help establish uniform guidelines. Um, they offer standards, procedures uh, for the compacts member states. They create economies of scale to reduce the administrative costs and other costs related to uh, occupational licensing. And um, they definitely uh, work to respond to national priorities in consultation or in partnership with the federal government. So working very closely with the Department of Labor and um, other agencies out in DC that can help provide information to fill these gaps. Next slide, please. Okay, so I was gonna talk about the Ivy Tech model, but um, more detailed information from Ivy Tech is coming up shortly. So I'm just uh, gonna to go to the next slide. So when considering um, occupational licensing barriers, you have to look at both sides. Um, so looking at uh, the first bullet point, um, it may promote a competition for jobs in other states, uh, companies, industries uh, that could lead to a skilled labor force migration to other states. So, um, you know, states stealing other states and employees. Um, and then with the constant changing laws and regulations, how can these other states keep up and maintain uh, this licensing efficiency? 
so a lot of uh, state issues uh, that need to be to be uh, looked at when focusing on licensing. But then on the other hand, um, it can ease transition for active duty service members, their spouses, as well as other citizens. Um, you know, we have all of these, you know, jobs in these, these fields that need to be completed, but if I'm a single parent coming from Tennessee to another state, it can be an exorbitant amount of, of fees that I have to pay. Um, one example is, um, you know, again, the fees for licensing can be extremely high and vary by state. For example, um, the cost for an initial license for a C MA in Nevada is $225. That's just for the license. And in Oklahoma, it's 15 bucks. So you can see the, the great disparity between states and what that fee will be. And that's not to mention other occupations that have to put a, a bond um, even before they start, typically of three to five thousand dollars. So what tactics can we use? Next slide, please. Again, how are we gonna move forward? So you have to apply tactics. Um, definitely uh, identify equivalent military training and experience and apply it appropriately. Um, last winter, um, MEC uh, in conjunction with uh, NSHIMS uh, did a survey. Uh, it's called the Military Transcript and Experience Review, a 13 state scan of policies. And what we did, uh, we looked at all of the Midwest states to see which ones uh, had policy directly related to um, reviewing military transcripts and training uh, on uh, college campuses uh, for credit for our uh, men and women in service. Um, fast check training, absolutely. Um, you know, there's all kinds of bridge programs. Um, there's portals. A good example of a, a student portal is uh, Minnesota State University. They have a wonderful one where folks can go in, put in their information of what their MOS was, and they can see where they can get that degree, how many credit hours do they need, and uh, they will actually be uh, put in contact with a direct advisor from one of the institutions. And really, it's leveraging all of these things that uh, we need to do in order to participate um, as a collaborative. Uh, putting all of our knowledge together and uh, working to overcome uh, some of these obstacles that our men and women face. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that that really wonderful data-driven analysis. That is something that we we always appreciate happening having. Um, next up, we will hear from Amy Stone with the Ivy Tech Valo project. Hello there. Thank you, Adam, for the introduction. Um, okay, so if you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so here is a just a quick overview of um, what we're going to talk about today. Um, next slide, please. In 2019, Ivy Tech Community College was awarded the Department of Labor Veterans Accelerated Learning for Licensed Occupations, or VALO, grant. Um, the mission of our grant is to remove or reduce barriers that veterans and transitioning service members face when seeking employment within licensed occupations. On the screen, you can see our objectives within that mission. Next slide, please. Um, when we began this work, we used the Veterans Licensing and Certification Demonstration Final Report as a guide. Uh, along the way, we've made a few adjustments to that. Uh, we added a step specifically to pathway development after the gap analysis um, to kind of individualize the process for each occupation. Next slide, please. Um, so the first First step is to assemble a team. On the left, you can see the final reports recommended team members. And on the right, you can see our VALO partners. Some other key partners uh, in our project is, of course, the Council for State Governments. 
Um, the 2018 VALO recipient, Kentucky Science and Technical Corporation, um, our fellow 2019 VALO recipient at St. Francis University in Pennsylvania, and as well as the Multi-State Collaborative on Military Credit. Next slide, please. So the next thing we did was select occupations. And the way that we did this is we created a spreadsheet that displayed the civilian occupation, um, the licensing agency, the military equivalent broken down by each branch, uh, relative, relevant Ivy Tech programs, projected annual job openings, median salary, total military separations nationally in that occupation and total military separations to Indiana within each occupation. And so from that, we were able to narrow down um, 20 targeted occupations. Um, one big challenge that we had with this step is that our scope of work for the grant um, limits us to focus only on occupations that are licensed by the state, not industry recognized and or required certifications. Some key occupations specific to Indiana that deserve more thorough pathways that don't fall within our scope of work would be examples like welding, electricians, linemen, um, and some other related occupations. Next slide, please. So the next step is to understand civilian employment requirements. Um, our partners at CSG work critical in completing this step. Our main takeaway from our meeting with the Indiana Professional Licensing Agency was that the quickest way to licensure is by meeting the educational requirements through a state accredited institution, such as Ivy Tech. Um, because most of our occupations had some sort of gap, direct reciprocity from military training wasn't an avenue that we approached um, for the occupations that we chose. Next slide, please. Um, so understanding military occupational specialties. Getting a hold of POI has probably been one of the major challenges. Um, Kyle, the project coordinator, and I attended the CCME conference last year, and we made some vital connections there um, with others that are doing similar work, and they helped us get the P some of the POI that we needed, as well as the multi-state collaborative um, on military credit. They have Sarah specifically has been a main contributor to our POI um, attainment. Next slide, please. So produce a gap analysis. We had multiple groups working on this from different angles. Faculty members at Ivy Tech were contracted through the grant to produce a curriculum gap analysis. Uh, without our faculty members, this would have been near, um, nearly impossible. Uh, CSG also does a legislative scan on a regular basis to evaluate what others are doing and compare that to our practices. At the conclusion of the gap analyses, um, we will either modify our curriculum or course content policies or develop, approve, and deliver accelerated courses for veterans. Next slide, please. So this is the step that we added um, to the recommended steps, and that is the pathway development in the occupational specific planning. Um, since each occupation isn't going to move on to each step at the same time, um, that's why we, for others that are planning on doing this, we, we definitely recommend adding this step. Um, in, in addition to the gap analyses, the faculty members um, recommend pathways for implementation. Um, this is still ongoing because of the approval steps and the red tape that, that Sarah mentioned that we have to go through from the accrediting bodies to award credit that wasn't previously awarded in each program. Next slide, please. So the next thing would be to market to veterans. For this, we will rely heavily on our partners and other existing veteran organizations um, to identify the best way to get information to veterans and transitioning service members. Additionally, we have developed a searchable database that links military occupations to Ivy Tech programs. Within the next year, we'll be expanding on the information populated by the search. Currently, 
a search will display the linked Ivy Tech program. Um, we will add additional resources, resources such as licensing requirements if ap applicable links to obtain the service members joint service transcripts, um, links with educational assistance information and other state and local veteran organizations relevant to the occupation or pathway. Um, adding in that's website is a link to their website, is, for example, is one of the things that, that will be added in there. Next slide, please. So develop an assessment plan. Um, this one is really important to me. Uh, we wanna make sure that the work we do for this grant doesn't end when this grant ends. Um, so really integrating our practices and our initiatives systemically within the college is will be key, um, as well as ensuring that there is someone within the college continuously assessing the work, assessing new POI, and then tracking veterans and student success. Next step, please. So next, we're going to talk about our challenges and best practices. Um, the lack of centrally located information has been one challenge. This could be because we're relatively new um, to this higher education world when we started the grant. Um, but even at that, finding centrally located information was still challenging. Um, the next biggest thing that I really wanna highlight is the high demand from our state the agencies and our college to create bridge programs for occupations that are outside of our grant scope of, scope of work, as mentioned earlier. Um, some good examples are welding, electrician, and linemen. Um, in the near future, Indiana, like the Lieutenant Governor was talking about, all the job openings that we have are primarily going to be in, the, in, in those industries that are without are outside of our scope of grant, our scope of work for our grant, um, and so that's been a really hard thing to, you know, when I have people from the college and and veterans telling us that you know these are the jobs that they're they're looking, you know, looking for and not being able to dedicate my time towards that because of um, those limitations. So trying to find a workaround of that. Um, has been a challenge and, and something that um, that we hope will continue after after our grant period. Um, another challenge was is the lack of information available about local veteran populations. So we were able to find significant data on veterans on a national level um, and somewhat on a state level, but specific data on a state and more specifically our college level. Um, has continued to be challenging. So Ivy Tech enrolls nearly half of all veterans attending secondary education institution um, in the state of Indiana. And one of, our, one of our focuses is to increase the data that we collect. When we first started this grant, we did a survey um, and started some of that. But tracking the veterans at Ivy Tech and enrollment and student success is something that um, we definitely would like to see some improvements on. Next slide, please. So the last thing I wanna talk about is our best practices. Um, the cross-state communication and collaboration, I think has, has really helped um, kickstart our, our grant and help it move forward. Um, you know, talking to Sarah on a regular basis, talking to the other Valor recipients on a regular basis and kind of learning what others did before us um, has helped us overcome some of those, those early barriers um, and kind of expedite some of our work. The other thing that I think would be important for others that are you know, doing an initiative like this is a stakeholder engagement. Um, and the veterans, first of all, because just getting to know what it is that they want, um, what they're looking for, um, you know, this, this initiative is focused 
primarily around the veterans. Um, and so we want to create a product that, that they want um, and that would be beneficial for them. The next one would be faculty. So like I said earlier, this would be near, nearly impossible without, without our faculty. Um, so they look at that POI, they, they dig down deep into what the service member learns at their training and they compare it to Ivy Tech's curriculum. Um, and that, I mean, we just couldn't do that without them. I, you know, I don't know enough about nursing. I don't know enough about being a mechanic to do that myself. So, so that's been, that's been huge. Um, as well as the state agencies, federal and veteran agencies, just keeping them engaged, keep learning from them and brainstorming, um, I think has really benefited our initiative. Um, with that, that's all that I have. I want to thank everybody for their time and their their interest and dedication to, to helping veterans by being here today. Um, and thank you, CSG, for putting this together. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, we will be sticking around for, for some Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to, to post them in the chat and we will we will get to them. Um, we have gotten a, a couple that that we're ready for, um, so I will go ahead and start reading those out. Um, this is a question for for Max or Sarah. Um, will other states recognize licenses from states that recognize military education experience or training, which I take to mean as if if a state does recognize that somebody receives a license from that state is that license applicable in, in other states that do not recognize military training? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that. So the answer to that is it depends and it would depend on whether or not the state, uh, that, that secondary state chooses to. Um, you know, Sarah, we, we always love seeing our, our friends uh, plug the National Center for Interstate Compact. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, an interstate compact is one way in which states come to an agreement among themselves on sort of a standardized set of, of what they will recognize. And so uh, it would currently as it stands, it would be up to each individual state. It is not uncommon for uh, states to have pathways for uh, licensures that for alternative certification pathways in one state, it is not uncommon for another state to still recognize those licenses. One that comes to mind for me is in teaching, you have Teach for America, which most people know that program. It's uh, a second state. Uh, if you achieve your uh, educator license through something like Teach for America, it's not uncommon for a second state to uh, still recognize that through their traditional pathways of licensure transference. So as it stands right now, it would likely be a similar pathway if you have a veteran who went through a program either like the Ivy Tech model or some other expedited or, or shortened pathway, that secondary state would very likely go through their traditional process of recognizing an out-of-state license. Yeah, I, I concur, Max. And um, again, that's where the importance is of uh, compacts and collaboration come in regarding occupational licensing. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, okay, so so a question for for Amy or for Sarah. Um, how long is the is the process expected to take to make changes so that military education experience or training can be recognized either through something like the the Ivy Tech model or some of the other models that you discussed, Sarah? Um, so I can start off on that one. So like Max, it depends um, for each occupation. Um, some are going to take longer than others. I know, um, so we, we had 20 occupations and we started with five and then we added another five to that. And so this fall, we'll be taking those to the curriculum committee, most of our health sciences occupations. So depending on what they say, you know, if they say our work, you know, that looks good. Yeah, we can add this, this crosswalk, then we would see probably next spring or next fall enrollment into those, those programs. 
Um, but it really depends on those accrediting bodies and the curriculum committees if they are if if our gap analysis and our our recommendations if they agree with them or not um so it, it really depends um per each each occupation i think the health sciences one that's why we started those first it seems like there's a little bit more red tape um within those occupations at the same issue, um, the Kansas Board of Regents uh, built a student portal uh, so uh, veterans can go in, put in their MOS, and see what's available. And the first thing that they did, uh, they wanted to uh, get all of the uh, instructors from the military in one room and all the faculty members in one room. Um, it, it was very interesting. Uh, the military did think that the people who taught it in the civilian level, yeah, you, yeah, you can't teach it like we do at the military. And the faculty members were that you can't teach it the way we you know, do here. But it was after coming together and they started talking, they realized we we'll use the same textbook. So um, it, it was just incredible. And then the room just like lit up. And it was also uh, partially for um, sharing uh, course syllabi from uh, the institution uh, with the military and vice versa with the uh, P POI, the program of instruction. Uh, and that really kind of solidified that, that relationship. So um, yeah, again, Amy, it depends on um, who you can get around the table and uh, get that conversation started um, and working together. Great. Um... This is a question specifically about the Ivy Tech model. Um, obviously, it's it's one that that uh, does not utilize legislation passed in a state legislature. But if if this was to be repeated in other states or even as the project grows in Indiana, uh, how might legislatures be able to support the implementation of a, a Valo type model in in their state? So. One way that I think legislation would come into play in the VAL model would be in the areas of expediting the veteran applications. Once they've completed the pathway at Ivy Tech, then they're still going to have to apply for the license through the licensing board. So expedited application process, um, reducing or removing the administration fees um, would be a way that the legislation and, and licensing boards could assist it with that. Um, but, you know, and so, some of the other occupations are outside of Ivy Tech. So like police officer, um, some maybe firefighter, some of the other ones are work that would be outside of Ivy Tech. Um, they wouldn't come through Ivy Tech to get, to, to meet that um, gap. And so, I think that it, it could be encouraged in other states by bringing on a community college or a large institution in your state, bringing a represent, uh, representation from there and then the licensing board and asking them if, if they've tried an initiative like this before. And I would assume that they probably will say yes, but at some point they got stuck. Um, that's, that's what we ran into. We talked to other people in the state that said, yeah, we've tried this, but this is, this is the point where we got stuck at it. Um, and identifying that, and you can reach out to us and, and if we haven't got stuck there, um, or know someone that has got stuck there and we're able to move past it, we can try to make those, those connections. But, but really, I think just starting the conversation and getting those, those players together, um, because it's not something that just legislation can do alone or just an institution can do alone. I mean, it, it takes the entire veteran um, advocacy community to properly implement um, programs like this. Sure, and uh, one other area, I'll say two, one really quick, is that uh, a legislature would want to make sure that for the case of those occupations that do fall outside of a traditional community college model or could be addressed that way, that licensing boards do have the authority to recognize military credentials uh, in, in their licensing process because some licensing boards just simply don't have that authority. 
not explicitly, uh, it's typically not an explicit uh, line in law that says they don't, but it's simply not something that has actively been granted. So legislatures might want to look at that. And another one would be funding for community colleges like Ivy Tech or other uh, institutions of higher education that would like to pursue something that uh, specifically caters to uh, bridging this gap. You know, the goal is for any program like that to be self-sustaining, but any program is going to take uh, initial startup costs and uh, maybe for several years uh, to, to continue to uh, be able to exist and, and, you know, be financially sound. And so state legislatures might want to consider that as well. Okay, great. Well, we have we have one last question, unless I see any more pop up in the chat, but both you, uh, Max and Amy touched on this in your presentations. But what would you say is the greatest benefit to using higher education institutions as a pathway to licensure over other ones that that have been mentioned? Um, so I would say that most of the military occupations simply do not match up perfectly to a civilian occupation. Um, I use the example basket weaving. Um, you know, in, on the civilian side, it might be required that you need to know these 10 things about basket weaving, but maybe in the military, you only need to know these eight things about it. And, but to get your license, you have to know all 10, but you only know eight. And as it stands right now, there's not anyone who recognizes those eight because a licensing board can't educate you on those two things that you need. That's going to have to come from higher education. So I think that's what we see most commonly is that there still is some sort of gap to fill there um, for each occupation. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really good point that you're going to have to go somewhere and to fill those gaps anyway. And I think institutions of higher education are uniquely positioned to offer the programming that fills those gaps. And I also think they're uniquely positioned to uh, maximize the, the translation between uh, the military lingo and civilian side lingo when it comes to occupational licensing. You know, in Sarah's presentation, you heard her refer to a 68 whiskey. Well, your average person on a licensing board it may not know what a 68 whiskey means. And so they're, they would be hesitant to, um, they, they would be confused at first perhaps, and then hesitant to try to do that translation on their own without the support of an organization like an in Indiana, they're lucky to have an organization like InVets who can help do that. But not everyone is so lucky. And so uh, a, a body of higher education, whether it's Ivy Tech or someone else would be able to, in, in another state, would be able to, um, to to adequately navigate that translation and, and fill those gaps. And I'd like to add on to what Max and Amy said, um, you know, looking at the folks who are coming back to the Midwest, um, again, a lot of them infantry, uh, Ohio is uh, really dug down deep in the infantry MOS and uh, depending on what their JST, their Joint Services Transcript says, um, they can award credits for general education. So if they were deployed, they could earn, you know, three credits for uh, cultural experience or study abroad, um, maybe even a foreign language, uh, geography. So there are all kinds of things that can also be evaluated uh, for military training to higher ed. Well, thank you all so much. We are butting right up against time. So if anybody has any last questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Or if James, if you could go to the last slide, um, this is the, the contact information for myself and for Max. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, I want to thank the, the three speakers one more time, Sarah, Amy, and Max, for, for joining us today and for all of the work that you are doing in, in helping our veterans reach employment and, and ease that transition back to civilian life. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, the recording will be posted um, soon, and we will that will be posted again at licensing.csg.org for you to share with your networks. Thank you so much and, and have a great rest of your afternoon.